Arkansas are coming. There's a lot of people here. So, first of all, you can ask any personal questions you like. I don't have to answer them, but don't worry about any of these rules. Just try and leave some of the clothes intact, that's all. Uh, so, I asked not to have a moderator because I felt I was in relatively safe hands in Utah. I thought they might treat me gently. Uh, but, uh, I can see quite a lot of people. I can see a lot more phones, though. So, what I, this is what I thought we'd do. Uh, to the professional media as well. Everybody take a picture of just a dude who doesn't look anything like any of those people uh, standing with a bottle of water for about two minutes. I'm going to stand here and just deliberately bore your phones back into your pocket. Okay, ready? Take a picture, take a picture. Yeah. Nothing else is going to happen. You don't need to keep your phones out because I have there's no quick changes. I have no props. There's nothing going to happen that's any more interesting than this. And you're done. I might go over here. I might go over here. That's it. Do you just, how many pictures of this do you need? There's just that. Here's my front side, my right side, my left side, my back side. That's it. That's it. That's it. We're done. So save your memory cards, save your batteries. It's going to be a long day. Are we done? Does anybody feel they desperately need to have any more? Because look, I just no, I've already got 75. I need another three. We're done. Look, I'm seeing faces now. It's so great to see actual faces instead of little flashes and autofocuses. Uh -huh. Are we done? Phil? So, you can be honest. If you feel the need for more, she feels the need for more. Look. You're not done. You think they're done, but you have a special need, don't you? A special need for more pictures. No. And now Periscope is saying goodbye, Jason. And we're off. We're off, and it's going back in the pocket. No, she's not listening. Hello. Hello, oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Good. We good? Everybody done with the pictures? No, he's not done. No, because I've got a big camera, so I get special privileges. No. That's done. The big cameras are done. The big pointy things. It's not compensation. It's a proper lens. Okay. Hello. You done? No, no. How is this more interesting than what happened a minute ago over there? Okay. Did you get some? You got some now? Extra harsh lighting. Just one of those. Okay, it's fine. Alright, good. We're done now. No, you don't think I can see you, Mrs. Yellow and Black Stripey Top. You're done! Oh look, I went to Comic Con. I've got 4,000 pictures of Jason Isaacs in there. You just don't need it. Alright, so. Have you seen any phones? No. Okay, awesome. No more cameras. Now there's some people here. So, uh, I felt very sorry for the orphaned uh, video clips there that clearly nobody in the room has seen. That's fine. <laughs> this is a fantasy uh, con. And, and, uh, and oddly, there are. Uh, I thank you very much for cheering for all those things. I, I take no credit for being lucky enough to be in some amazing stories in my time. But as well as those. Uh, obviously the Potter films and, and uh, Peter Pan and Armageddon. There are some other fantasy things I've been in, just in case you don't know and you're going to ask a question, you can ask questions about anything you like, but uh, so, some of the other fantasy things that may not get top billing, uh, I was in, I was... Jeez, what are they uh, So some people like to do... Awake! No, that was up there. Awake, there you go, awake. There was a clip of that. That was a guy which I... Oh no, we're going to get like <laughs> a clapometer. Things that are... Some things are very popular and some things are kind of, oh, there's just muted applause for things. So, uh, I mean, I've done lots and lots of animation. There's some great voice actors here, obviously. And, uh, literally anything I said is going to clap. I don't like cucumbers. Wow, this is, everybody who's once in their life should get this as therapy. They just stand up. Just dribble any nonsense from their mouth and get rounds of applause and laughter. That's fantastic. Um, but I have, uh, so in case you want to ask those people who know, because I forget, I've done a bunch of video games. I don't know what they are. So, uh, but I've, 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 I've played Satan twice, I think, at least, uh, and various Nazis, and uh, and then various other characters. One of the great things about voice work is you can sound like uh, what you don't look like, so you can play anything at all. So uh, you can ask me any of those things. I was in, as well as Event Horizon, I was in Soldier as well. Yeah, there you go. No, that's, I threw that one out there deliberately because nobody saw Soldier, not even me. But, uh, uh, that and fair, and what else is fantasy? I mean, the Patriot is, I don't know, the Patriot does belong. 
Well, the reason I'm saying it is because quite a lot of people come up and ask for photographs uh, to be signed, and they come and they go, you know what's awesome about the Patriot? In 10th grade history, we studied it and watched it every day, and I'm like, who is teaching the Patriot as history? <laughs> Can I just say that Armageddon or even Harry Potter is more factually accurate? <laughs> Bruce Willis is as likely to save the world as Mel Gibson is to free this country from tyranny. Um, so don't be showing that to your history students if you're teaching the Patriots anyway. Um, but so, I see a, a lot of line of people here, um, many of whom are dressed fantastically, and I see a Slytherin in the front there. But, um, but many of the questions I get asked, I'm so unbelievably lucky and privileged to be uh, standing up here. And I'm standing up here because I did some bizarre thing and became uh, uh, an actor for a living. And I did it because I was always very awkward. I always felt out of things. And one of the things I did when I was young, younger, <laughs> still so young, of course. Uh, one of the things I did was I was a comic book geek. And uh, if I wasn't up here, I would be out there because you're my people. This is, this is my world. And I was, all this is, I'm going to treat this actually as proper therapy. And uh, I was always looking for a group to belong to, a club to belong to. I felt slightly out of it. We moved when I was a kid a few times. And, and, um, and so I found it. I uh, found a lot of it in, in, in magic. I like magic and I liked uh, comics. I love comics and, and uh, I read them. And one of the hard things for me at conventions is I don't get to just walk around for hours and, and, and look into a, I don't know. <laughs> don't play the violins too loudly for me. Life is fine. It's fine. Cosplay. Someone said to me I should wear a Lucius Malfoy mask and walk around. Because who would think it would be me? Anyway. But so I did this thing that I, I found a thing that I loved doing uh, when I was at college, which is pretending to be other people. Uh, and I was more comfortable in their shoes. Uh, and uh, I, I ended up being up here. But because of uh, because of being in Harry Potter, I mean, I've been working for 30 years, I've done many, many things, but because of the unbelievable joy and reach of those uh, stories and how well they were told, uh, I get to come and talk to people lots of times and just witness that, uh, the effect of it and how much it's meant to so many people. But that does mean I get asked a lot of the same unbelievably boring questions over and over again. So what I thought I'd do is save you the grief of looking at my face as I try, I, I swallow a little bit of vomit uh, when, when I get asked the same questions over and over again. So uh, I'll try, I'm going to answer some of the questions you might be thinking you want to ask. Probably not, you look like a very intelligent bunch, but, but um, so people ask questions like, what is it like being in Harry Potter? Well, uh, what's it like being a human? I don't know, it's a big question. Uh, was it fun? <laughs> I got to play a wizard in one of the best films ever made, the best series ever made, and I, and, uh, I, I don't do anything very serious for a living, I, I dress up in funny clothes and put voices on, and you don't get funnier clothes and better voices than uh, we got to do in that, so that's that. Um, sometimes people ask, uh, how, like, what's Daniel Radcliffe like? like uh, you can't ask what a person's like. You know what I mean? A person. It's a whole, it's a big question. Anytime, because I have some friends who are well known, you see them summarize. Everyone's got one sentence about a person. Oh, he's trouble. Or she's funny. And he and all of them are fabulously interesting, rich, diverse people. And, and, uh, and I can't sum them up, so don't ask what somebody was like. This is kind of pointless. Um, how did you get the job? Now, let me advise you something. If you ever meet any other actors in any other context, and, uh, and you get a chance to have a chat with them, don't ask them that because it's always unbelievably dull. All, it, all the answer is, my agent called me, I got a script, I went to meet my audition, and I got a job. And uh, it's, it's like asking, you know, how do you wipe your butt? You know, it's, it's, there's, there's forwards and backwards, there's very rarely sideways or two-handed. Uh, so, uh, but I, funnily enough, weirdly enough, how I got the job on Harry Potter was quite a strange one, uh, because uh, I'd already been offered the part of Captain Hook and Peter Pan, which I was very excited about. <laughs> which, uh, and I, I thought the script was amazing, I was very, very excited to do it, and then uh, I got a phone call from the agent, and he said, uh, You've got to, if you want it, there's an audition for Harry Potter, uh, you can fit it with your Peter Pan schedule and stuff, and I went, great. Uh, and uh, they sent me the script, and I was very, very excited to be auditioning for the part of Gilderoy Lockhart. <laughs> I, was, I knew there were some other very famous people, not I wasn't famous, but some much more famous people up for it, even a friend of mine who I thought was probably better casting, but I liked it, and, and I knew that I hadn't seen the first film, I wasn't actually out yet, uh, I think when I, but I knew it was going to be good, and, uh, and it was a big sensation, all my friends were reading the books, which I thought was a little bit weird.
weird because they're children's books and I thought my friends had maybe taken a knock on their head at that point, <laughs> is what I thought. Uh, but anyway, I went into to, uh, audition for Gilroy Lockhart and Christopher Columbus, the wonderful director, was there and I did my best Gilroy Lockhart, which was, dare I say it, sensational. And, uh, <laughs> and it so knocked him back, he was so impressed, he immediately asked me if I would audition for a different part. Uh, <laughs> And, and if I would read for this part of Lucius Malfoy, and I glanced through the script. By the way, the scripts for these things are so top secret, they print them on dark red paper with your name across, and you have to sign a piece of, you know, a huge contract saying you'll never tell anyone on pain of death or stuff. And uh, it's, it's pretty hard to read on dark red paper as well. Uh, but I remembered Lucius Malfoy vaguely. I wasn't looking at that. And he said, would you mind, would you mind going outside and like, taking 10 minutes, coming back in and read for Lucius? And I went, Sure, yeah, that'd be good to meet you. And I went outside and I got my phone and I phoned my agent and I went, Jesus Christ, I must be going to this half I don't want to do that, it's another bad guy, I want to play bad guy, it's so embarrassing, it's humiliating. And the agent went, just calm down, just go in and read, you don't have to take the job. Just go in and read. I said, I don't want to go in and read, I don't want to do it. It's an insult. And, uh, and just in the middle of one of the, they came to the door and said, you ready? And I went, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Fabulous, thanks. Uh, and I went inside and I read, uh, I did something, I don't know, you know, I winged off the top of my head. And um, I came over and I said to Major, I don't want to do it, just if they call, say I'm unavailable, I got sick, my dog died, something, I don't want to do it. And, uh, and sure enough, they called uh, within a few days and they said they'd like to offer you a part of Lucy's Malfoy. And I said to my agent, say no. I think it was a Friday, I said, say no. He said, well, think about it. I said, I don't want to think about it. I'm not, I'm not doing two children's villains back to back. That seems, that seems dumb to me. And anyway, Gilderoy Lockhart's a much better part. And uh, he said to me, he said, you're not getting Gilderoy Lockhart. They're going to Ken Brown. I went, that's a big mistake. He said, and, <laughs> and he said, well, take the weekend to think about it. So uh, I, I told my wife and kids what I was doing, and my kids were very little at that point. And uh, over the weekend, my phone began to ring. First of all, my nephews, and then their friends, and then my godchildren, and then adult friends of mine, all going, you have to take the job, you have to take the part. It's great, a fantastic part. I didn't understand why this was happening until it dawned on me, because the first film was out uh, in the interim. Uh, I, I think it had taken a couple of weeks from the audition of the film to come out. And it dawned on me, they all wanted me to take the job just so that they could visit the set. <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. And uh, I thought, oh, I, oh, I mean, God, I don't want to. Maybe no one will see it, you know. Uh, and, uh, and I took the job, and it's the wisest decision I ever made in my life. Um, and uh, Kent Branagh, God love him, uh, came and did a fabulous job, and then was gone, and I was in another five or six films. So that all worked out. Uh, so that happened. Um, uh, what other questions I asked? I know another question I was asked thousands of times yesterday. Uh, first of all, you don't, if I meet you today, which I hope I meet lots of people, I can't imagine, unless I was here for six months, I wouldn't have the chance to meet all of you, but anyway, uh, people come out and they go, can I ask you a question, do you, do you like playing the good guy or the bad guy, the villain or the hero? And the honest answer, I know it sounds like a, a, a pose, the honest answer is, uh, there are no good guys or bad guys, I don't play any of those things. Um, I try, and I take, if I'm lucky enough to have choice, I take jobs that allow me to play someone I recognize, someone that's human. Someone that, you know, who uh, I think I can bring to life without being a cartoon, even in cartoons. Uh, so, uh, so Lucius Malfoy, to me, is a racist, you know. I, I don't know if any of you have ever met a racist, they exist. I'm told they're the odd one. Oh, someone put a hand up. I am. Oh, good. That's good. Uh, good for you, sir. Well said. I love this country. It's free speech. The First Amendment. It's great. Um, uh, so Lucius Malfoy is a guy who uh, hates muggles, and why does he hate muggles? Because he's scared of them. Because uh, he's scared of the future. He doesn't even think that the future has a place for him. He preferred the past when he had all the power. And uh, he's scared of the other. You don't need to look too far, I don't want to get overly political, or, but you don't need to look too far in my country, or in Europe, or in this country, to hear people demonizing the other. Whether it's immigrants, or Muslims, or whatever it is, you know. You don't need to go too far to hear people who are scared and think they can maintain their status and power by, by scapegoating, by fighting some group. And uh, Lucius Malfoy obviously comes from generations of people who had all the control, and yet things are changing at the edges. Muggles are allowed into Hogwarts, and uh, there are, you know, you don't have to be a pure blood to be uh, important anymore. Uh, and, um, and he's terrified of that. And that kind of fear 
makes him a bully and a racist and desperate. So when people think about him as a bad guy, a villain, to my mind, villains are people you're scared of. Nobody's scared of Lucius, he's pathetic. <laughs> he, he's so desperate for the approval of Voldemort, he's so desperate for uh, any kind of status for people to look up to him, that he'd sacrifice anything, first of all his dignity, but he'd sacrifice his wife, his kids, and in the end they see through him as well. So he's, he's a terrible loser, a rather pathetic, desperate, completely recognizable human being to me. You know, when I, when I watch him, I hear all of those very right-wing politicians in Europe talking about closing up the borders and not allowing refugees in and, and blaming problems. And, yeah, it's hilarious. It's one of my best jokes. Um, and so that's what I think. Captain Hook is another one who, before the film has started, has already lost to Peter Pan. He's got no, got no right hand. Which, by the way, just as an aside, was very annoying. I arrived in Australia, they went, we're going to teach you to sword fight. And I said, I don't think you need to do that. I'm pretty good at sword fighting. You may have seen the Patriot and various other films. And they went, well, with your left hand. And I went, oh, shit. <laughs> You're kidding me. Do we have to do that? They went, I'm spot my bad language. Cover those children's ears. I apologize for that. Uh, it's a quote, younger me. Uh, I just won't look. It's a short down there. I can't look. Uh, so I had to still find my left hand. But anyway, Captain Hook is a guy who is also, but uh, he's terrified. He's terrified of everything because he's terrified of youth. He's terrified of getting old. As, the, as an actress of a certain age, I can tell you, I, I, I recognize those feelings uh, profoundly. Uh, so, um, but anyway, he, uh, so he, there's a man who's lost also and is desperate and nobody's generally scared of him. Even the man in The Patriot who is, you know, is not always in the sense that he, uh, he's doing pretty well in battle uh, till right at the end, and is slaughtering his prisoners and killing children. In those days, it turned out when I was in research uh, before we started the Patriot, they had this strange system in England where the first son gets to inherit everything, and the second son doesn't. So I was, I made, was making a film in Germany last year. We were shooting this big castle, and uh, at some point people went, "Oh my God, the prince is coming! The prince is coming!" The, the crew, not in the script. I mean, in real life, I went, "You have princes?" And they went, "Yeah, yeah, we have the guy who would be." Well, we we have a you know, we have a parliament now, but I mean, we still have a royal family and uh, this guy owns like castles everywhere and he's a billionaire and if we had a king, he would be king today. And they all were kind of slightly like that and this guy walked in. And um, I'm a big Republican, I'm a big fan of the monarchy. And so this guy walks in and he goes, hi Jason, nice to meet you. My name's uh, George, I think his name is George. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our castle. I hope it's nice for you. And I said, well, you've got a castle. He said, yeah, I have like 35 castles, yeah. <laughs> I said, geez, that's, that's a lot of cleaning. What, what do you, uh, so, you, you, well, I hear people saying you would be Kaiser. He goes, yeah, that's like King or Caesar, but I'm from that family. I said, how far can you trace your family back? He's like, mm, I think like 1400 years or something. And I said, yeah, oh my God. And I said, uh, is that what you do full time? He said, no, I have a staff. I also have a hedge fund and all this stuff. But, but yeah, it's a big estate. We have like something like you know, one tenth of Germany and my family owns. Oh, that's impressive. And um, I said, it, uh, uh, what, you share that with your siblings? He said, no, I was the first son. So my, my brothers have nothing. I have twins, twin boys. And I said, all right, how old are they? He said, seven. And I said, what happens? It gets passed on to them. He said, no, the older one will get it all. I said, how old? He said, yeah, he's old by two minutes, yeah, he will have a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so, in the Patriot, it turns out that there were a lot of officers fighting in this country uh, because they were the second sons, and they weren't going to get anything back home. So if they won, then they, every time they, they would ride around with a map, they would carve out areas where they won. They were building a future for themselves. And if they lost, it was nothing for them. They're destitute. They relied on the grace and favor of their elder siblings. So for me, even that guy was real. Because in war, you dehumanize your enemy. I've been privileged enough to know a lot of soldiers in, in, from, I met on Black Hawk Down in Green Zone. A lot of them Marine Recon guys and Rangers and um, Delta guys and stuff. I don't really clapping me for their unbelievable service. But anyway, I hope you heard that, wherever you are. Um, but, uh, so in war, there's a, you know, people are, uh, one of the great things as an actor is you meet people and they don't feel like they're talking to journalists, they will confess things to you that they would never tell the public. Maybe they would even tell their, their spouses and stuff. And there are times that you dehumanize your enemies, the only way you can get through things. And you no longer see them as people. And that's, you know, uh, that's part of the thing you need to do. Sometimes something you shouldn't have to do. So uh, there are people 
very impressive alpha males who have done extraordinary and noble and courageous things have also told me that on certain occasions, everything that moved was fair game because they were scared. Everything that moved, cattle, women, children, you know, uh, adults, it's just, it's a, a space they got into. So I thought that Colonel Tavington was in the place, he's trying to win the war, and everything was fair game. He had dehumanized the enemy, which is what people do. So anyway, that's the answer to, to good guys and villains. No one ever thinks they're doing the wrong thing. There's not a single person even that outrageously orange person with the, the dead squirrel on his head who is, uh, who is saying some of the most appalling things I've ever heard said in public since the 1930s. Even he thinks he's doing the wrong thing, the right thing. Oh, that was Freudian, wasn't it? Thinks he's doing the right thing, if indeed there is any thinking going on there. Um, so, don't, 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 so, that's the good, bad thing. Was it fun doing Harry Potter? How'd you get the job? What's Daniel Radcliffe look like in his underwear? Um, oh, what's the other one? No, I can't be doing heckles, because if I respond to that, then they go, oh, it works. Shouting out works, that's good. I'll do that, and all of a sudden, it'll be chaos. Well, that is a good question. But anyway, um, so the other thing I'm going to do, you might sit down, I'll be a while. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is, when people go, what's your favourite scene, what's your favourite moment? I'm going to try and encapsulate everything about Harry Potter in one story. Um, because it's my most vivid memory. You know, I was there for 10 years, over 10 years, and I had a fabulous time. And in fact, every single day that I worked, incidentally, sorry I didn't meet you earlier, every single day over the period of those five, six films, I had five kids visiting me. I had to say, you know, I started off with my relatives, then it was distant relatives, then it was strangers, then I would auction off the chance to do it for charity. And the producers were amazing. They, all, they always had some extra person laid on to take the kids to visit all the sets, because they built all the sets, not like a normal movie, they knew they were going to use them repeatedly. Visit all the sets, visit the creatures uh, workshop, visit the special effects place, the zoo, come to where we were shooting, put the headphones on, get to call cut and action, and unfailingly, all the kids, Daniel, Rupert, Emma, and lovely Tom, who played my son, would, would always come up and go, Hello, you having a nice day? What's been your favourite bit so far? They never changed. They were such lovely, lovely people. From when they were 11 or 12 to in their 20s, it was extraordinary. But, um, but weirdly, although I was there millions of times, the first couple of days are seared into my brain because it was such an unusual thing. There's a couple of things that are unusual. One is I've been in many, many, many films. Only a few of the good ones are highlighted here. I love it when people come up to the table and go, I gotta tell you, man, I love all your work. And I go, you haven't seen all my work. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that even my mother wouldn't watch. But anyway, uh, but, but on Harry Potter was so different because you knew that these were great stories and people were gonna love them. And, and we made them with love and we were all huge fans. By the time I got to the set, for the first day, I'd read the four books that were published and realized what the phenomenon was and how brilliantly and beautifully the stories were told. And um, so, I, so here's the story of my first day or so. And then I, I will take some questions, I promise, eventually. Um, so first thing that happened is I went down to, uh, I went down a couple of weeks early so they could get, they have a little tryout of your makeup and hair and, uh, and all that and check you haven't put 40 kilos on since you got the job and all that stuff. So I go down and they, uh, I go into the makeup room and she said, well, we're really not going to do anything with it. I think you'll be fine like that. We'll just maybe a bit of powder, just your hair, how it is, maybe salt and pepper. And I went, what? And they said, yeah, I think you're good. I'm just, just good to go. How you are? And I went, well, what about a wig? And they went, what do you want a wig for? I said, because I play a wizard. I said, well, wizards don't wear wigs. And I said, well, some of them do. Don't tell me that's Richard Harris's hair. There's no way. I'm sorry, there's no way. And they said, well, you know what, he's, he's got that way. Why would you want to do it? You're a businessman. I go, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I go, Lucy's mouth, I've read the books now, all right? He is a wizard. He hates muggles. He's not going to have a muggle haircut. They went, what we have? I mean, just by the way, the director has approved this. You know, we've done some sketches. And I went, well, by the way, we're not shooting for two weeks. I'm, I, I just indulge me for a minute. Let me try something. He goes, well, we haven't got any, you know, we haven't got any of you to try on today. And the director wants to have a look at you today. I go, we must, what's that? I pointed to some like five dollar truck stop wig, you know, Halloween wig. And they went, well that's, you know, I said, just let's try that. So we try this, you know, platinum blonde white plastic wig on. And she goes, in my opinion, that looks kind of silly. And I go, well, it's a five dollar wig. I'm hoping you make one better than that. So right, I see this wig, I go down to costume, and they go with, and they've done some lovely designs, these kind of, you know, full length, not full length, down to their pinstripe business suits, like I'm on Wall Street. And I went, um, so, uh, and they go, what, you don't like it? I mean, we can change the, you know, the colors. I go, why am I in a suit? They said, well, because he's a businessman. I go, well, who is this businessman? 
that everyone's talking about. And he's a wizard. He's a wizard. He's, he's, he hates muggles. And he would, she said, well, what do you want to dress in? Janice is French. She goes, well, what do you think you should wear? I go, I think you should wear, like, you know, fur and ermine and aristocratic clothes that have been in this family for thousands of years. What do you think you should wear? Old clothes? I go, no, he's got a spell that refurbishes them or whatever. He's, like, he's a wizard. I want to wear old Beautiful aristocratic she goes, Well, we don't have anything here. I go, What about that? And like, we grab like a velvet curtain, just like a piece of velvet. And I wrap it around myself, and I got this $5, you know, Hollywood and Pine wig. Anyway, so we go down to the set uh, to have the leather director have a quick look to the other people. And he's shooting the pixie scene with Godra Lock on. He's quite distracted by all the special effects and everything. And the, the assistant goes, uh, Chris, so we've got Jason for a, a quick look. And he went, where? And I went... Hi, it's me. And he went, well, uh... What's, what's going on? What's, what's happening? I said, well, uh, you know, I thought that... <clears throat> I said, he's a wizard. I thought he was a wizard. And he's wearing this thing, the hair. It's not it's like my muggles. He goes, yeah, I, I hear your argument. I hear it. Did you see the sketches? We had him like in a, I got, oh yeah, a businessman suit. Yeah, but I, I thought, he just said, he's a, he's a wizard and he doesn't like, you know. No? He said, no, no, that's cool. All right, we can do that, sure. Okay, anything else? And I said, yeah, I thought maybe I could have a, a, a cane. And, it, and he said, he said, is there something wrong with your leg? And I said, I said, no, no, I thought, I thought maybe the wand could come out of the cane, you know. He said, no, the wands, we have a thing with the wands, they just, they just appear by magic, like you don't see them, they come out of the back of people's like hoods or sleeves or something. And I said, yeah, I know, I know, but I thought... <laughs> you know, maybe it could come out of the, the cave, like a, like a sword stick. He went, he's a lovely, lovely man, and he went, I think the toy guys are gonna love you. <laughs> So that's how Lucius Malfoy's look was born. And then, so she, you've got the right idea sitting down. You can tell I'm just rabbiting on, sorry. Uh, and then my first day, uh, there was a day just sitting and uh, looking at a green screen with a tennis ball on a stick, which was watching Quidditch. I just had no idea what planet I was on. But the first real day, first, you know, they don't make films in order. So the very the first real day was the, the last scene, almost last scene of Chamber of Secrets, when I'm in Dumbledore's office and I go to his desk and all stuff. And, uh, and Richard Harris is a, was an absolute hero of mine. He was a genius actor. For those who don't know, he played Dumbledore in the first two films. Uh, and I was very, very intimidated by Richard Harris. Extremely intimidated by him. Uh, but I, I know his son from drama school, so I, I led with, oh my God, Jared, your son, just the greatest actor I've ever, he's so, he was so much better than the rest. I mean, not as good as you, because you're amazing, but he, he was, you know, I did a lot of babbling fan stuff, and he seemed to like me, and it was all good. Um, and we did the first rehearsal of the scene, and uh, I had to come up, I was very aware that this film was already crammed with some of the best actors I'd ever seen in my life, who I'd seen on stage, and that it had the ultimate villain. Dear, dear, late, uh, gone, I can't believe I'm saying it, it's so weird to talk about it. But anyway, the wonderful Alan Rickman had been in it, and he plays me. <laughs> nobody on the planet in history who played Sinister better than Alan, and I was in this film, and I thought, what the farm animal am I going to do? to try and make any kind of impact. I thought, I know, I'll come up with a voice. I'll come up with a, some kind of voice. And I wanted to make it like fingernails on a blackboard. I wanted you to hear this voice, and it just, you just be, you just want to punch him as soon as he opens his mouth, whatever he's saying. If he said, you've won the lottery, you go, <clears throat> And so, uh, I, there was a guy at my drama school who bullied me, bullied everyone. It was a horrible, horrible bully. But a very high, very aerated voice, and he used to say things to me, I do a performance, but I'd go, you'll never work in this business, Isaacs. You're, you're a waste of time. None of your colleagues like you. I don't know why we let you in in the first place. So uh, uh, there was him. And then there was, a, there was an art critic in England with a, such a strangled voice, not high-born at all, but had adopted a voice that was posher than posh. Uh, and he had this extraordinary voice. And I thought, if I combine those two, maybe I can come up with a voice that is just dripping with privilege and power and, and snobbery. So I came up with a voice. And we get to the set, and I do the first rehearsal, and uh, <laughs> just and the director comes up to me and he goes, Hey, Jason, can I have a, can I have a word? Which is never good. Like, 
No one ever wants to take your side to go, that was awesome, man, that was great. So he takes me aside and he goes, oh, uh, I gotta talk to you about the voice now, because I'm American and I, I, I don't know if there are people ever who spoke like that in the world. <laughs> and I said, well, I, fair point, but there are people who speak kind of like that, and I pushed it a bit further. He goes, do you mind if I ask the producer to like cast his ear on it because it sounds kind of weird to me? And I said, no, no, it's fine. And the producer, who I knew socially, came to watch, uh, came to my dressing room actually before we went down to shoot, knock on the door, and uh, he said, Jason, it's David. I said, hi David, how are you? He goes, so what's the, um, what's this going on with the voice? And I said, oh, I was doing, so now the art critic's name was Brian Saul. He was a figure of fun for the whole country because of his voice. And I said, I was doing a kind of Brian Saul this thing. He went, oh, Jesus. Uh, do you think it's going to work? And I said, oh, I think it's going to work. I, it feels like a good choice to me. But I mean, if it doesn't work, you'd always replace it or we could do it different. But I think it's good. He went, oh, OK. Do you mind if I come and watch the first run through? I went, <laughs> you're the producer. You can ask me to do this whole thing in a clown suit, if you like, in French. So no, you can watch. So he comes out of the first rehearsal. And uh, the very first moment is, uh, in the scene that we, that we shot is, uh, I can, is the last bit of the scene where Dumbledore basically dismisses me, sends me out of the room. And I remember so vividly, Richard Harris was telling some scurrilous story about his adventures in the 1960s, which are really not family friendly, not even suitable for adults. I don't know who this is, but great storyteller. And he's in the middle of one of these things, and we get up uh, to sit down, and, and, and I'm aware that everybody's watching, thinking, uh, what's this thing? What's he going to do? It's just weird, like the producer's all by the monitor. And, and Richard's got the first line. Somebody, I'm sure many people should know what it is, but we were shooting the scene out of sequence, and he says something like, That'll be all, Lucius, or something like that. And, um, and we go up, and uh, he's chatting, and we're laughing and laughing, and they go, Okay, you're in position, and you know, rolling camera, saying, you always, your heart goes a little bit, and you, you know, your bum goes a bit tight, and you're like, oh, God, it's my first baby. You know, I better not blow it, a lot of people watching, you know, since you, you've always worried you're going to look over the monitor and people are going, oh, oh, oh. So, I, and, I, and it's Richard's first line, and I, I don't actually have anything to say at that point, I was, uh, you know, for a while, it's Richard speaking. And uh, they go, action, and Richard just looks at me. And I go, he's holding this a long time, isn't he? And then I think, Go on, speak. Oh no, how sad. He's old now, he can't remember his lines. <laughs> so bad. And then, enough time goes by and I think, Oh God, it's my line. Oh God. Oh God, I don't know what it is, I can't remember, I didn't even look. Oh God, I'm sure it was him first. Oh no, it's me, it's me. And then it starts, panic starts to spread. Panic, and my, my stomach goes on the wall, and I start spat, you know, my throat goes dry, I start to sweat a bit, and I go, is it, oh God, is someone gonna say, cut, is someone gonna say, shout the line out? And just at the moment when I'm really feeling queasy, he speaks. Because he was Richard Harris, and he took no prisoners, you know? <laughs> And he said, that'll be all, Lucius, thank you. And I said some line, I can't remember what it was, and, uh, and he said something, dismissed me, and, uh, and I turn around, and, and I walked out of the room. And I just sort of flounce out of the room. Because <laughs> I was new to the hair, I thought, yeah, let's do that one. And, um, and I said a line, I can't remember what it was, and the producer comes over, and, uh, and the director comes over, and Daniel's there as well, and they go, okay, the voice. Uh, well, it's, it's pretty extreme. And Daniel, God bless him, goes, I think it's cool. <laughs> and the director went, okay, all right, we'll go with the voice, right? And then, and then I walk, I wonder if the director goes, okay, so let's do it again. Great, great first take. When you get out of the room, could you just you shut, maybe shut Dumbledore's door behind you? And I said, all right. So anyway, could just, could I just close it by magic? Is that all right? And he went, uh, I looked over at the special effects guys, and they went, <laughs> and they went, by the way, the magic was a piece of fishing line. That's what it was. Like. <laughs> and uh, they went, sure. And I went, oh, this is going to be good, man. I like this. And then I said, well, sorry, I forgot to ask, where's Dobby? Where's Dobby standing? Was well, he's in the scene. And uh, uh, he goes, Dobby will be standing wherever you look. Where, where, do you want, where do you want him to be? Just look there. And I went, right. Uh, okay, yeah, all right. Because, I mean, keep looking in the same place. You don't want to be like, you know, we don't want to jump off the roof. I go, yeah, all right, fine. So now I'm in the scene, and uh, he goes, that's me all, Lucius, thank you. And I go, and I, and I turn around, and I go down the stairs like that. And the director goes, okay, cut, it's great, sorry, can we just polish the floor? 
Jess, is it, is it, is it slippy there? I said, no, no. He said, what was the, what was the thing with the, what? I said, I, I kicked Dobby down the stairs. some weird thing with your cane at the bottom of the stairs? I said, yeah, yeah, when Dobby tried to get up, I hit him on the head. Hit <laughs> on the special face guys, by now the special face guys making notes all the time, you know. <laughs> That's fine. So then, so now, now I feel a bit more, you know, a bit more confident. We're in the scene, you know, the voice has been given the thumbs up, it's all good. And, uh, and then I said to, to Chris uh, Columbus, I said, you know, the only thing is, I feel like there should be an end line. I feel like, as he dismisses me and just kind of, I just walk out and listen to my he's such a, He's such a proud man that people be so careful not to swear. But anyway, he's such a fill in the blank uh, that, uh, that I think he would say something to kind of try and regain his dignity. He said, okay, let's do another one. Just, just say something. I said, you want to run it by the actor? No, no, just say it. They'll, they'll be good. So I'm standing there. I go up and, and Richard goes, that'll be all. Thanks. We'll see you. And I turn, I look at Daniel and I go, Mr. Potter, there will always be a rhyme to save the day. And Daniel, oh, 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 oh. Daniel, who is all of 12, and slightly intimidated by having seen everyone, in, you know, me and other things, just puffs his little chest out and he walks up and he goes, don't worry, I will be. <laughs> uh, and I thought, this is going to be good. This is going to be good, they know what they're doing here. And, it was, and that my, that's my first day and I remember it so vividly. I've actually told the story a few times, but not because it's an anecdote, but because it was so seared in my consciousness. And from then on, there were many fantastic adventures, but that was just as an introduction to a world that was going to be magic and filled with brilliant actors and creative people. Uh, and that, was, that set the tone forever. So, I've got a million stories I should tell you, but I feel like you're all standing there and you'll go home and go, I stood there and I didn't ask a question. And I why don't we go to the bathroom for an hour? So, Take some questions from someone. Hi. Hello there, Jason. Hi. If you were to seriously consider joining the military, <laughs> and there's a lot of veterans here, which branch would you join and why? The makeup corps. <laughs> uh, look, uh, it's a good question, and I've played lots of soldiers. And you know, a lot of actors like to think themselves as tough guys. Uh, certainly, the people who play tough guys and live in that tiny bubble of privilege uh, in West Hollywood. Uh, the worst thing that happens to you is they put too much milk in your macchiato. Um, they can fool themselves, uh, you know, that they smoke unfiltered cigarettes so they could cope in Afghanistan. But me, I've been lucky enough to train with the Rangers of Fort Benning, train with the Parachute Regiment in. Uh, in the Brecon Beacons in England, and then spent a lot of time with uh, the real Met D team and, and Marine Recon teams in Green Zone. And I know that I am not fit to clean their boots. Uh, and, I, and one of the amazing privileges of my life is that I get to be in war, and there's no real bullets. You know, I get to uh, I get to have uh, intimate relations with beautiful young women uh, who would not, frankly. <laughs> Look at me if we were the last people on the planet. Uh, you know, I get to have fights with big tough guys and, uh, and knock them down and, and never for a second do I think I've got what it takes to be one of those brave men and women to do all of this. Hi, my name is um, You're my favorite Captain Hook. That's my Thanks favorite. Thanks very much. And I was wondering, there are a lot of hooks at Mr. Darling. Did you take it as inspiration, sorry I'm nervous, That's from right. any of them, or did you kind of just come up with your own idea? So, thank you for asking that, because it gives me an opportunity to say something that, that a lot, quite a lot of people, particularly women, come up to me, and they, you know, obviously I'm here mostly because of Harry Potter, but then they, they kind of look guiltily on the show and they go, actually my favourite movie is Peter Pan. You know, <laughs> a lot of people. Uh, and, and it's one of my favourite films ever, uh, that I've been, I've been in a lot of films, and the reason is this. Not just because there were amazing people who made it, and the, all the people, the, the, the you know, the costume people, the, the DP, the, the photographers, well, they had all made Moulin Rouge the year before. They'd all got Oscars, and they were amazing. But it wasn't because of that. And I thought the director was amazing and all that stuff. But because J. M. Barry's story, the book and the play, is an amazingly profound story about what it's like to be a young woman or to be a little girl and be told, okay, that's over. Now you're ready to be a woman. And that's a terrifying thing for kids. I've got a little girl who turned 14 two days ago, and uh, she is on that cusp of, you know, she still sleeps with the teddy, she loves our bunnies, but there are kids in her year who are wearing makeup and, and an awful lot more, you know, and uh, 
And in those days, when the book was written, if, when you were 12, and Wendy plays with her brothers, and you know she plays with being pirates, when you're told you're not sharing a room with your brothers anymore, it's time to be a woman, that meant it's time to get married and raise a family. There was no adolescence, there was no hanging out in the mall, you know, in between. It was just straight away, it's it, you're a mother, you're married, and, uh, and you, you're going to have to do all those things and have children and all those. And she is terrified, Wendy, of that. It's, it's in, unfathomable to her. So that night, she goes to sleep, and guess what she sees in her sleep? A boy who's her friend who has his baby teeth, who's never going to grow up. And a man, because she knows she's going to have to be with a man, who is so terrifying and it's strangely attractive and familiar to her that it's always the same actor who played Captain Hook and Mr. Darling. It always has been for a very long time. And it's a very grown-up Freudian nightmare. And we did that story, J.M. Barry's story. And uh, I thought it was done with such... And, and, and Rachel, who played Wendy, was just cast at the perfect moment. She was a little girl when we started. And she was kind of a young woman when we finished the film uh, 14 months later. And um, it's such a powerful story and it resonates so much with, with girls and women. So it, it, it seems insane to me that people concentrate on this boy character and make a film called Pan or make a film about Peter Pan grown up. Because it's not his story at all. It's a story about Wendy, it's a story about girls and what this world expects of women and young women and how hard that is. So I thought we did that film he, PJ Hogan, adapted and made that film so stunningly well that I've got lots of friends. My kids don't watch it because their, their dad's in it, so it's just you know, weird. Who wants to watch their dad on video? But, but other friends phone up sometimes who have kids and they go, Ah, oh, I am so sick of your face. Uh, Goddamn Peter Pan's been on like 12 times this week. Because kids watch it, then the girls don't know why they need to watch it again and again, but it's because it reflects their experience. So thank you for asking. It's, a, it's a, one of the favorite ones. Practically obliterated your wand. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say he castrated my wand. <laughs> Explain that to your kids if you like. <laughs> what type of a wand do you think Lucius replaced it with? Oh, you see, that's one of those questions. <laughs> your knowledge of the books and the literature and the world of mythology goes so much deeper than me skating the surface of what I did. Uh, 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 the answer, I'm avoiding the question, because I clearly don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm way out of idea. But in answer, I'll tell you about my second day, I think, my third day on the set, was the, the bit that's in the clip, which is when I get knocked over by Dobby. And it said in the script, uh, first of all, I remember someone visiting the set going, this is the corridor where you're getting knocked out? So yeah, there's, there's supposed to be two steps in here. <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> this is it's going to be tricky navigating the fans' uh, intimate knowledge of this. But anyway, uh, I get knocked out, and it says in the script, you know, he raises his wand, starts to do a spell. And I went, Abracadabra, is that a lot of spells? You know, I don't know, it's the second day. So I said to one of the crew members, guys, you know, pulling something along, go, dude, what's a spell? Give me a spell. I don't know any spells. He goes, I don't know, mate. I don't know, I've only been here two weeks, or not. I? I said, anyone got a spell? Anybody got a spell? Someone got, one of the boats went, uh, Varda Gadavra, I've heard of Varda Gadavra. Yeah. So I, I don't know, so I lift my wand up and I go, Varda oh, and I get knocked down by Dobby. I cannot tell you how many thousands of people wrote to me and went, how dare you? You were going to kill Harry Potter in the corridor then. <laughs> if somebody had said to me, Hocus Pocus, that's what I want to come up with. You know. It's keep people to win a dribble. I, I've noticed so. Uh, I don't know, is the answer. Uh, I grab whatever I'm wondering why. I do know that um, Lucius is a coward, that most bullies are cowards. And, uh, and I, uh, I took it as my brief to try and create the kind of character that would explain why Draco was such a horrible bully at school, and why, to me, he's the hero of the whole piece, because he breaks the chains of generations and generations of bullying. destiny is always to make the heroic choice, but Draco, he turns against everything he's been raised to do and all that stuff, and he does the noble and right thing in it. So anyway, uh, uh, I've got this wand that someone's given me, probably one stuck down the back of someone's sofa, you know, it's not as serious one. No one takes me seriously at all anymore. And, and one of the things that we did right at the end, Dave, lovely David Yates, who directed the last four and was just directing the new three, three films, he said, what are we going to do with Lucius at the end? He was very keen to tie up everyone's story. By the end of this eighth film, Joe Rowling was fine with them taking a different direction from the book sometimes, because, you know, films are different from books. So, every day, when we were shooting other things, they come up and go, come up and think, I was thinking maybe this, I was thinking maybe this. And one day, I had this, what I thought was a great idea. And I said, hey, when he's in the courtyard, and, and 
Voldemort the Death Eaters advance and go in to kill everybody, what about if he wants to go in with them because he's desperate to be by Voldemort's side and prove himself again, but he also sees Narcissa and Draco going off in the distance and he just doesn't know which, he kind of, he's stuck there for just long enough that everybody tramples over him and you see him trampled in the courtyard and we see boots on his face and David goes, I love him, I love him. Let's shoot that. And it's scheduled, and that's no mean thing. That's, you know, money and time, and I'm like, oh, God, they're doing it, that's great. And we shot that, we shot a scene where I went, advance with them, and I, and I look around, and I see them there, and then, boom, I get trampled, and the people run all over my face. Then about a week later, they said to me, ah, I was realized, I was thinking, Harry and Voldemort land in the same courtyard about a minute later. And people are gonna go, what the hell happened to Lucius? He was just on the floor there, that's good. <laughs> So that shot you have on the bridge at the end was done afterwards, it was a kind of shoot afterwards. He said, the best thing we can do is make it look like you're, because I thought Lucius is stuck between two worlds. Obviously, he's, you know, he's rejected by, uh, he'll be rejected by the new administration, and his wife and kid will want nothing to do with him because he was prepared to sacrifice, and that's why we got a shot of him stuck in the middle. And that's the smartest way I can think of of avoiding that question. question for you is, if you could make a horcrux, what would it be and why? Oh. I'm going to say, I would make... So what you don't know about me, there's many reasons I'm a geek in many areas. Comic book geek, I'm also a tech geek. I was on the internet before the web, I was on Newsnet, bulletin boards and stuff like that. And I've always been... This is bizarre. I've always been an Apple evangelist. When they were down the dumps, when nobody had them, when people thought they were ridiculous machines, when I had a Lisa and a Cube, if anyone knows what those things are. And a Newton, all those Thanks very much. The two people with, uh, <laughs> two people who subscribe to the same obscure magazines I do. Anyway, um, so, uh, I would make an Apple Watch that had any reason to exist, uh, unlike the one that exists at the moment, uh, with large enough font that an old guy could read it. That's what I would do. I would make that my whole point. There you go. Hi. How different was it for you to prepare to play Captain Steel as to play other military characters you've played? Well, that's an interesting question. So Captain Steel is a character I played in Black Hawk Down. We all went to Fort Benning and trained with the Rangers for a week, which was uh, an amazing privilege. But it wasn't just army training. We met the guys who had survived that night, and we met the families of the dead, who uh, unfortunately didn't come home from Mogadishu that night. And we felt the heavy weight of responsibility in telling their story. Mike Steele wasn't there. He was off in Bosnia, and he was serving. But I heard from a lot of other people stories about him, and they're not all flattering. You know, he, he was a very controversial figure. And... Uh, it was a, I mean, I played real life people before, but this time I was playing someone who was currently serving and had men under him. And there were things that I wanted to do or anecdotes I'd like to have put in or things that would maybe throw him in on such a great light, but I didn't know if they were true. I heard other stories about him. He was a very, and still is, a very, he's a general now, I think, a very big man, a very powerful, dominating figure. Some people loved that, some people hated that. Um, but. Unlike almost anyone else I've ever played, the whole time I imagined this six foot seven, four hundred pound pack of muscle watching me play him, and, uh, and that was uh, that was something. And I was aware that he was still serving. So it, it, the whole shoot for all of us was different from anything else I've ever done. What I did, um, Green Zone, he was a fictional character, and so I could feel entitled, and able to kind of make bold strokes in different directions. But but with my steel, I felt like. It, it, this happened, people died that night, he's still alive, he's still serving, and so I just felt the parameters were much narrower creatively. So the only thing I could do, here's the thing, so Mike Steele's this very, very big man who famously, uh, in Mogadishu, when they were training in the big hangars, would walk around naked. Big, giant man would walk around naked, he would sit on the edge of his cot bed with a fan, keeping his private school, and he would give commands, all this stuff, just walk proudly around like that. And he would wrestle people. Don't read anything into that, but he would wrestle people quite a lot. He liked to arm wrestle, he's a, you know. And uh, so I would meet people and they go, hey, so you doing the movie? Who are you playing? And I'd go, Mike Steele. They'd look and they go, you're playing the white rhino? <laughs> you know, he was like six feet. I go, yeah, I've heard. You know, he's like, four, yeah, yeah. You know, he walked around here. Yeah. So I didn't feel that I wanted to walk around naked. I didn't feel I could get to 400 pound of muscle. I was never going to be six foot seven over years. So I shaved my head. That's as close as I could get to conveying all those things. I thought a naked head, that's an indication. So uh, that, that was my, what my preparation was. Oh no! 
It says naughty, naughty, naughty. Uh, there are hundreds of people questions. They've gone. The answers were four, a fish, bicycles, Chinese food, when I was 12, and you really shouldn't ask that question. Uh, that's, that's all. Um, I should vacate the stage. My, my wife makes, I used to make documentaries for the BBC, and she said one of the great things about making documentaries, the reason she was so incredible about getting interviews out of people is that everybody has an infinite capacity to find themselves interesting. Um, so I could talk forever, but the truth is uh, that there's an Avenger waiting in the wings, so I better go. And uh, I'm just a guy that puts makeup on and runs around doing funny voices for a living. So when you come up and talk to me, there's no magic. I'm just some dude that does a job and goes to the supermarket just like you. Uh, and I can't wait to meet you. Thanks for coming.